How's it going, y'all? Um, so, like Dr. Harris said, I'm going to be talking about the SS Thomas T. Tucker. Um, we're going to be what we're going to look at today. Uh, I'm going to go over some general Liberty Ship specifications. Uh, we're going to talk about Liberty Ships in the United States World War II war effort. Um, I'm going to talk about Liberties, and by Liberties I mean Liberty Ships, um, and South African United States Maritime Heritage. And uh, we'll look at the SS Thomas T. Tucker. We'll look at a site map and we'll look at some photos. Pretty exciting. And uh, we're going to talk about site formation. You know, how this thing turned in from a Liberty Ship to what's left, which isn't much. So, general Liberty Ship specifications, for those of you that may not be familiar, the vessels were about 441 feet long. They were 57 feet beam. The cargo capacity was 10,000 pounds to include deck cargo, spread between five holds. The power plant was a 2,500 horsepower engine with uh, steam engine with two oil-fired boilers. Um, top speed it could get was about 11 knots. Not exactly going to win any races, but they had a range of about 17,000 miles. And the cost at the time was just under $2 million per Liberty. Um, this image here is the SS John W. Brown. Uh, it's from a model painting guy, just to give you kind of an idea of what the general shape and stuff is. So, Liberty ships in the U.S. war effort. How is there, what about their construction was unique? Well, during the war effort, um, the United States was looking for ways to increase their merchant fleet. As war, as war um, started, we realized that we had a very uh, outdated merchant fleet. So we took a design that we were constructing for the British, the Ocean Class Tramp Steamer, which was to try to help bolster their merchant fleet, and we decided to you know, work, it to, work it out with Americans. Instead of having a coal-fired boiler, for example, we use an oil-fired boiler because we had more access to oil than coal than what the British did. Um, they also would be manufactured and starting in different factories across the country, and then those parts would be shipped to other factories who would build more sections, and those sections would finally be shipped down to the harbors where they would basically be assembled, you know, almost, um, almost like a car, like cars with, the, uh, with that method. Um, the record for the fastest built Liberty ship was five days and 14 hours, I believe, from laying, a, laying the keel plates to launching it into the water. It still required several more days to be for a shakedown, get everything outfitted for whatever the vessel's mission was. But on average, you're looking at about a month to a little over a month per Liberty ship to be built. Um, these were named based on just important people in American history. Um, you know, these people were white, they were black, they were Asians, they were organizations. And um, if you were, if you raised $2 million in war bonds, you could recommend a name for a Liberty ship. Um, so, I mean, you have Liberties named after the USO Canteen 41, you have Liberties named after John Brown, Liberties named after Thomas Tucker. I mean, you have all of these figures in American history to the degree that by the end of the war, they were running out of people to name Liberties after because they built so many of these things. So the SS Thomas T. Tucker was launched in Houston in 1942, um, September 1942 to be exact, and uh, was part of a convoy that was ferrying military cargo to North Africa in support of the newly opened North African theater. This vessel would have made its way down from uh, Louisiana uh, through the Panama Canal around South America and then would have stopped in South Africa and then would have continued on up through the Red Sea into the Suez Canal. This route was done in order to minimize potential contact with U-boats, which is um, every, liberty's, every liberty's fear, since they were very slow. And they had an armed guard on board, but the armed guard couldn't always be as effective against, um, against U-boats. Um, this image right here shows the Thomas Tucker when it had ran aground. It's taken from a South African airplane. And this image right here shows, uh, from 2014, what is currently left of the stern section. The shipwreck is located at Olifant Post Point, which is part of the Cape Peninsula uh, National Park. It is a beach wreck. Um, it, what happened is after it ran aground, the local community made a spirited effort and salvaged about 99% of the cargo that was on board. They got all 54 of the Sherman tanks, they got all of the trucks off, all of the massive amounts of barbed wire. And um, sadly for them, they wanted to get off all of the food because with rationing and everything, if they could recover the food from the shipwreck, it would have been a nice thing for the community. But someone had left all the fridges and freezers open, so all the food had spoiled by the time they got there. They were really upset because it was filled with food for Thanksgiving because the vessel wrecked on November 23rd. But um, 
The vessel is part of the shipwreck trail, like Dr. Harris previously mentioned, and it's actually a regularly visited site, which we will discuss later. This is a site map put on Google Earth um, based off of UTM coordinates that we collected from, uh, from our work in South Africa. The, ship, the shipwreck is kind of spread out. There's about, I would, I would say there's about three major sections that are left. The rest of the vessel is just disarticulated metal pieces that you really just can't identify. Um, there is a few stuff mixed in that's not part of the shipwreck. For example, there's something called Paul's Fish Boat, which is some, by some uh, local, I assume, uh, fishing boat that is wrecked and it's just still sitting there. There's also a whale skeleton, which has nothing to do with the tucker, but it's there. Um, this is a site map that, was, that I put together based off of the GPS coordinates of Google Earth by tracing over it and then um, taking a picture of it, putting it on PowerPoint and making the map that way. Um, which can give you kind of another idea. So right up here is the, is the rocky, kind of where all the grass and everything and the baboons like to hang out. Here's the Atlantic Ocean and the sea line here. Up here is also where the uh, salvage drill that would have been built by the locals was. And you can actually still see kind of the, the paved area where, there, where this road once was. So some examples of images from the wreck of the Tucker. Here are the two images of the stern section from Tucker. And here is the what we think is the central portion of the vessel near um, another piece uh, we saw in the previous presentation where we think it was part of the engine room, which would have held one of the boilers. We have a couple pipes here. We've not really figured out what kind of pipes these are yet, but I'm, my assumption or guess is that they have something to do with the, uh, the steam plant. Here's a more close-up image of those pipes, as well as some of our field crew um, working on collecting the data. You can kind of see how the wreck is really extremely rusty. It's really degraded. It has, it has come apart from any sort of semblance of an actual ship. Um, this is also especially noticeable in the boilers that remain. There are two boilers in the northernmost part of the shipwreck. Um, there's a lot of a lot of degradation has occurred, and you've now got the foam lining that was inside these boilers has kind of been exposed, and um, whole portions of this engine of this engine room section have begun to fall off. Um, this could be attributed to the type of steel that Liberties were made out of. It was it was discovered that the grade of steel that was used for Liberty ships was an extremely poor quality, low grade steel, and it suffered from embrittlement at temperature extremes. So there's several cases of Liberty ships going through North Africa in the Medi sitting in the Mediterranean in port and cracking in half overnight. Um, the reason a lot of this happened, aside from the issue with the steel, is these used welds instead of rivets in order to save metal for the war effort. When you have rivets, a crack starts to form, it'll hit the rivet and the crack will stop. With welds, the crack starts and keeps going. It doesn't have anything to really prevent it from, from cracking and taking the ship apart. Um, so the site formation process is what kind of cultural and natural factors have impacted the site. Um, the site is very well visited. We know this because there's a geocache located on this site. And we were able to log on to the geocache website, find, this, find the Thomas Tucker geocache, and see a log of all the geocachers that have visited the site, what they left, what they took, any notes about the site, even to the degree that one of the, one of the users recommended that the geocache be closed temporarily because there was a nest of black uh, uh, southern oyster catchers. And so we looked up that species of bird, and it's on the yellow list in South Africa, which means it's not endangered, it's not threatened, but it's close. So you're seeing this public involvement by the people who are using the shipwreck trail, saying, hey, you know, we need to keep an eye on this site. You know, let's, let's not have people visit the geocache because the nest is located near. And it, I mean, it's great. You can see when there's more visitors. And obviously, in the summertime in South Africa, there's a lot more visitors than the winter months. Um, Natural factors, this is exposed to um, ocean, it's exposed to wave action. I know excuse me, while we were there, you know, we watched rather quickly as the wreck was recovered by water. A large portion, with the exception of the stern section and the parts on the beach, were recovered rapidly by the ocean. The, wave, the weather while we were there went from being kind of misty, and by an hour later we had I'm pretty sure we had horizontal hail. I didn't even know that was a thing, but it apparently is in South Africa. Um, and I mean, the weather just it changed at the drop of a hat. And this wreck is sitting there exposed to all this and has been for the last 73, 74 years now. And it's really degraded this wreck to the degree that it's, it's almost impossible to recognize some of the sections. 
Um, and this goes into the corrosion that's occurring on the rig. This is at the boiler, showing just some of the flakes of, of, of metal from the boiler that have fallen off. Um, this shows some of the corrosion on the stern. You see that it's actually the stern section has folded, so it's no longer a flat section of steel. It's folded over. And you see that the eyes of the vessel, um, these right here, are, going, are looking at a different pattern of corrosion than the rest of the vessel. Um, I'm just throwing a guess out that that's because those are made of a different material. I'm assuming those are made of an iron or a different type of metal than the rest of the ship. Um, but you can see that this is, this is undergoing a severe level of degradation. I mean, when we were there, there's, there's holes eaten in the sides of different parts of it. You have the metal flaking off. You have, just, I mean, you can see down this lower section right here, these are all parts that used to be attached to the stern. And that's not saying there's things that have washed out over time. This gives you an idea. This is the stern section in 1964. This is the stern in 2014. So you can see just how big of an impact that this wave activity has had. All the salt air, the crashing against the rocks. This is a very rocky shoreline. Once you're in kind of that little, this little area here, it's all, it's all rock until you walk a little further back and then you start to hit actual sand again. But this wreck is, is in, it was in three major pieces. It's crashed up against this rock 73 years, and it's just begun to fall apart. Um, it would be great for future research if someone could determine if, is it the steel? Is the steel why this wreck has degraded so quick? Because I believe there's a group in England, the Ships Project, have done some work with Liberty Ships. And they've shown that you know, their Liberty Ships are in a lot better shape underwater. I mean, I'm sure they're undergoing some active corrosion, but you can still see a Liberty Ship. It's, it's, it's a vessel. Whereas this one on the shore, it's, I mean, if you, if you were a maritime archaeologist or you're one that likes ships, you may not ever know that that was a Liberty ship. And here's some examples of the geocache that we found. Um, it was located on a beach section and was, actually we found it by accident because I was looking for a way to get out of the, the weather because it was pretty awful. And I happened to look and see what I thought was a first aid case because anyone that's been in, in the military knows it kind of looks like the first aid cases you have in your vehicles. So I got kind of excited took a picture of it, put the card up there, and then you know, told Dr. Harris we found something, she told me to remove it, and it turns out it was a geocache. So we opened it up and took a look at it, and there's a logbook, instructions from the person that has found it to tell them, hey, this is what you do with it. Take something, if you take something, you leave something. So you have an entire bag full of little trinkets. So people that are geocachers will have their own little little card. Like there was like a little rat earring from someone that was that's kind of his little card. And you put it in there, then you take something. And then in the logbook, you record um, you know, the date, the time, how you found it, and you put in there what you took and what you left. And you leave a little something like who you are, and what your geocache username is, and where you're from. And then you go to the website and you also um, upload it. And from what I, was figuring, what I found out is this Padawan guy has actually made several shipwreck geocaches across the world, not just in South Africa, he's gone all over the world. And this is a really neat thing, I would say, for managers, because this allows you to get an idea of visitation on your site. It's not going to give you 100% of your visitation data, but you can know how many people are visiting your site, kind of when you're going to see more visitors, when you're going to see less visitors, and it can kind of give you an update on, on how your site is, if this is one of those sites that you have to really travel to. Because, um, like I mentioned previously, on this site on the internet, they talked about the nest of oyster catchers. So, you know, these geocaches, and they're a fun way to even bring kind of publicity about your park. I've talked to a couple people that I know that are geocachers and they are really into this stuff. It's a global scavenger hunt thing. You have apps on your phone. There's a whole internet store for this stuff. I mean, it's really neat. But my acknowledgments, I would like to thank some of the same people that you will thank, the Ezekiel Museums of South Africa, um, South African Heritage Resource Agency, Cape Point Nature Preserve, Cape Town Tours, Dr. Harris, the ECU, and all the participants in the uh, study abroad program. So with that being said, if there's any questions for me, I will happily answer them to the best of my abilities. Thank you.